Mr. Grupo Radio Gold is Chiquito. So I'll do it in English. We have uh, five projects. The, we've got Plata Verde and Chihuahua. By the way, all of our projects are grassroots discoveries. Nobody, no company worked on any of these projects before. We found them all, and the ones in Mexico, we found every one in the last five years. Um, there's some I don't have up here, but Plata Verde, maybe I'll get a chance to talk about that later, because the talk after my one has been cancelled, so you might have to suffer me for a bit longer. We have Amalia that we've, is in Chihuahua. It's a classic um, epithermal, structurally controlled, vein and breccia system, very similar to Sandy Mas and Palmarejo. We've been drilling that for the last four or five years with um, Pan American. It's a good discovery. We've got 67 drill holes onto it, some fantastic grades, um, but I don't have time to talk about that a lot today. Uh, then we've got Tropico, the new discovery that I will talk about, and in Guatemala we've got a lot of projects also, some orogenic ones, and if anybody heard the discussion about false orogenic ones, this is a real orogenic one. And we have Holly, that is a, um, an epithermal, very high-grade vein in Guatemala. Guatemala has some fantastic potential. The government is used to be difficult, but now it's probably the same as Mexico. <laughs> um, so, we're going to talk about this project called Tropico. It's in the Mexican Silver Belt in the Altiplano. Uh, most of you here will know that belt. It's full of giant deposits run by big international companies and Mexican companies. It's a good belt to be in, and we would like to talk today specifically about the Fresnillo district. So, I've been working in Mexico for 20 years or more, and I knew that Fresnia was a big deposit. It's a big vein system. I knew that it was one of the biggest, but I didn't understand globally how big Fresnia is. It is the world's uh, oldest constantly operating mine. It's been going since 1550 in constant production. So that's 470 years. So Mexico has something to be proud of. It's the oldest mine in the world that's in constant production. There were mines found before and mines found, you know, that might have a longer history. The Romans found mines, but this one has been in production for 470 years. Some people, a lot of people lately, I've just been in a conference in Vancouver and they say, oh, the laws in Mexico are terrible, the new introduction by AMLO is going to be a disaster. And one of the things I say to them is this mine has outlasted 150 governments. So I think it's going to outlast the new mining laws as well. And to get an idea of scale, this photo, this painting is from 1850. Um, that's the patio in Fresneo City. This is the uh, Cerro Prano. That's the fire alarm. We don't need to worry about that. Um, so they were using mercury amalgam and horses to process the ore and, and take it out in 1840. Um, apparently, they've mined four billion ounces of silver, three to four billion ounces. Nobody really knows because it's 470 years, but to get a, an idea of scale of, uh, you know, four billion ounces, what is four billion ounces? It's equivalent to 57 million ounces of gold. And if you think globally, what deposits are bigger than 57 million ounces of gold? There are not many. Kalgoorlie Super Pit, Moran Tau, um, the South African, uh, Witzwaters Rand, maybe one in Nevada, but there's not many mines in the world that have 57 million ounces of gold and equivalent, and this is one of them. Um, so, this is the district uh, of Fresneo. The city of Fresneo is uh, there in the middle with the discovery of Cerro Prano in 1554. It was outcropping, so it stuck out of the ground. It was a hill, as you saw in the image before, and they started mining it then. But they didn't start finding the other veins until the 60s and 70s. And, be, and that was basically, be, you know, the invention of modern drilling. When they had drilling rigs and they drilled off on the plains, they started finding more. So in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, they started finding these other veins, right up until the period of about 
the 2000s. And then uh, there was a company called Mag Silver. Peter McGraw, his daughter is here. He reckoned he could see the, the Peñoles rigs out on the bean fields drilling towards the hill. And he saw that hill and it was altered and it had a sinter on it, which was key. And he went over there and said, we're going to drill here. We're going to find another thing. And they found one a Scipio. Now that has just entered into production about two years ago to give you an idea about how big one a Scipio is. The current resource is about 30 million tonnes, but they are mining a, a, a part of that resource called the Bonanza Zone. The Bonanza Zone is 10 million tonnes at 650 grams silver, about 2.5 grams gold and some lead and zinc, so it's big, uh, very high gross metal value, you know, a great world-class discovery. And we saw some alteration and a breacher across the bean fields on the plains called Tropico, and that's where Javier and I are going to go to work uh, next month. So <clears throat> if you took a knife and cut across there and put a section across the middle of it, um, this is the, a rough section. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. It comes from Peter McGraw's economic geology report. And what is interesting about this is Sarah Prana was the only one that outcrops. All the rest are blind discoveries. Most of them don't have geochemistry at surface. Most of them don't express at surface. They're all hidden. And they're hidden about two to three hundred meters under the subsurface. So now to Tropico, our project. You can see in the distance the um, mines of the Fresneo district, and we're out across the veins in the bean fields as well. This is two weeks ago, and that's a geophysics rig um, done by a, a Mexican company called Geotem. Uh, I can't recommend them highly enough. They did a fantastic job. Um, so anybody looking for ground-based geophysics in Mexico, it was the first time I used Geotem, and they were great. Uh, so what do we find? We have a a sinter and a breccia pipe. And it's subcropping. This is a drone image looking down on it. And this is the model from uh, McGraw's Mag Silver discovery showing the sinter at the surface, the breccia pipe underneath. And the important thing to know is that the sinters typically do not have gold. Um, they're typically barren. And the um, the ore zone is about two to three hundred meters down, and it would take me a long time to explain why that is, but just keep that in mind that when Mag Silver drilled below the center at Fresneo, the center was barren. It had a little bit of mercury, a little bit of antimony, a little bit of arsenic, but no gold. Yeah. So we've got center, and it grades 0.8 gold and 29 mercury. And we've got the breccia pipe in the middle of it. It's all subcropping. It doesn't stick out. Otherwise, it would have found it a long time ago. But again, high values of gold and mercury off the charts. Now, I came to Mexico 30 years ago, no, 22 years ago. And the guy that I worked with, Simon Ridgeway, was fascinated by sinters. He's not a geologist. He's not a mining engineer. But he found two mines below sinters in Honduras in Guatemala, and he sold them and made his fortune, so he's fascinated by sinters. He sent me here, and I spent a whole year. I visited 360 hot springs across the Mexican volcanic central belt from Nayarit to Puebla, looking for these. We didn't find this one because it's not boiling today. <coughs> um, but I wanted to show you, we'll just go back. Think about what's on the surface there and what most, there's not a lot of hot spring systems in Mexico that you can go and see and compare it to. So what is a breccia pipe and what does a sinter look like? And this is one of them. And I use this one because I live there. It's just down the road from my house. This is called the Champagne Pool. It is an epithermal breccia pipe. And the fluid comes up through that pool. It floods out over the top and it creates uh, center terraces. So the center is the silica coming up. It's dropped out the metal already way below if it was going to when it boiled, maybe 200 meters underground. And the silica deposits as a surface deposition. And just to show you that this one, that red stuff on the 
outside of it is a arsenic, mercury, and high-grade gold precipitate. There's samples of that that's up to 90 grams. The thing is, we can't mine it because it's boiling. It'll blow you out of the ground. Uh, that temperature of that lake is about 95 degrees, and it's called Champagne Pool because it's pink in it and it effervesces from all the dissolved gases in it. Now, oh, I jumped too far. Just 300 meters from that is a collapsed breccia pipe. Um, you can see that that white stuff is silica and it is kaolin and you can see the blocks falling in. And why is this important is because Javier, my chief geologist, was out there mapping the other day, and he's never been here, and he sent me back these photos saying, Bruce, there's a collapsed breccia pipe in the middle of our thing. And I said, this is exactly what it is. What we also have, oh, I keep jumping too far, is acid leach. So around these epithermal breccia pipes and sinters, you should have a lot of kaolin. You should have a lot of clay alteration. And in this case, you're seeing the acid is a, is a yellow liquid in the bottom of the pool. That's pH 1. Usually in these epithermal systems, the, the destructive nature of the acid is in the gases. But it just here is hitting surface water. If you fall in that pool, you come out as, you know, you can throw murdered bodies in there because, you know, they'll disappear. Um, so that is a modern example, and now we're going to go back in time 29 to 31 million years, which is the age of the Fresneo district. This is our map. You can see that this is Javier's map. He's mapped a, a breccia pipe in the middle, collapsed breccia on the edges, um, sinter and uh, explosive clays and things like that. And I'd just like to show, and you can take a look at the We've got plotted up there geochemistry, rock chips and soils and gold, and you can see it's anomalous all over. There's good grade. For Sinter, these are fantastic grades. So what does it look like? This is, why did nobody find it? Is because mostly it's covered. This is a rubbish dump hole, and the top of it is all caliche, but in the bottom of that rubbish dump hole that somebody not kindly dug for us, We've got Sinter, and that is classic Sinter, the sample on the right. People look at the sample on the left and say, well, that's just chalcedonic silica. But you can see, for me, clearly that, that that's a Sinter. That means it's deposited at the surface. That means we have the whole system below us preserved. And that grades good gold and mercury. This is the explosive breccia pipe. Um, intensely smashed rock, intensely silicified. We have to smash it with sledgehammers to get samples in some cases. And this is the collapsed breccia we were talking about. You can see the blocks that are fallen down hole into the holes. This is not a mined hole, this is a natural collapse. So it's the sa exactly the same system as we see in a modern environment. And we, this is photos important because there's a lot of area that there's absolutely no outcrop. It's just bean fields or, you know, in this case they weren't planting beans, but they could, but, you know, uh, grazing. And we don't see anything. We didn't know anything was there. We didn't know this was there until we found it in the geophysics. And we said, hang on, we should go and find out if something's there. We dug through. It's just intensely... Uh, Kale and I altered, and it's full of um, bits of opaline and chalcedonic quartz. So we think that's part of the system as well, and I'll, later on I'll show you why this is important. So going back to our model, breccia pipe, sinter, we've just run some geophysics. You saw the geophysics, it's only a week old. We put in CSAMT, controlled source magnetotellurics. The reason we use that is because it tracks resistivity, so it's tracking silica, and most importantly, it looks down to, you know, great depths, depending, but, you know, we've got resolution to about eight, 900 meters underground, and that's where we need to be, because you can see the gold zone in here is occurring at Fresneo, the main Fresneo mines is occurring from 300 to six or 800 meters below the ground, and so that's where we need to be looking, and IP resistivity won't get there. 
So this was the, the first image that we got, and you can see that we've put in yellow on the top where our sinter is, and our breacher pipe, we've got the rest of it covered in brown and soil, we can't see anything, and the red um, is resistive, which actually measures pore space, and if you pour in silica, you fill pore space and you get resistive rock. So that's exactly kind of what we want to see. High resistive rocks below our sinter and penetrating to depth all the way down to seven or 800 meters. And the jump from the blue on the left-hand side to the red is about a tenfold increase. So we go from the host rocks being, you know, let's say one resistive, to jump to the red rocks, which are 10 resistive. And, you know, this is our, this should be our ore zone underneath, comparing to the model somewhere two, 300 meters underground to seven or 800 meters with the boiling point in the middle. And the boiling point's important because when the fluid comes up, it's got saturated with gold and silver. It's in a hot, tightly controlled fluid when it boils, when the, when the overbearing pressure is, is superseded by the fluid pressure, it boils and explodes. And at the boiling point, the fluid changes from liquid to gas, dramatic changes in pressure, dramatic changes in pH, it drops out the gold and silver at that point. So that's why the boiling point is important. And that's our model, that's what we're gonna drill. We can see the, you know, the resistive structures, the breacher pipe, we've got the gold at the top, we're going to drill there in August. But what was interesting is I didn't show you the whole image because we didn't know about this other thing. We'd never seen it, we don't know what it is, but it looks the same. So it had cover on top of it. I said to have a year a couple of days ago, jeepers, I didn't know there were two of them. Um, so we went out and dug those holes and we dug through the, you know, a meter through the soil cover in Caliche and we're just finding intense uh, kaolin alteration. We don't have assays or anything yet because it's only been done a couple of days ago, but we think that there might be another pipe. So a few people have asked me, uh, well, your concession is really small. You know, it's only 200 hectares. How can you build a mine there? I would argue that 200 hectares is easily enough to build a big mine, if not two. Um, it's a small license, yes, but you just need to think about examples. I acquired a 200 hectare license in Argentina uh, 12 years ago. Um, we were drilling a breacher pipe there called Chinchillas. We've since drilled about 70,000 meters on that. It has become a mine five years ago. We never found anything off that license. We acquired all the rest afterwards, but that core 200 hectares is now the mine of Chinchillas, operated by Silver Standard. We never found anything else, so the core 200 was enough. And in, as a Mexican example, um, I've got our geophysics and our geochemistry on there. We only did a little bit, because when I started, I didn't have enough money. Um, we've just raised some money to drill and to do geophysics, so we'll cover the lot of our license in the coming months with more geophysics, more chemistry. But what we know of is 450 metres long. And out of the group that I work with came Fortuna Silver. Fortuna Silver has got the Oaxaca mine, it's called San Jorge. And at the Oaxaca mine, I don't know if anybody's here from that mine, but the key ore chute that operated for now it's 16 years and, and held that mine together. It's only 400 metres long, right? It's 30 metres wide, it's 400 metres long. That sustained a mine for the last 15 years. So you don't need tens of kilometres of strike length. Um, and in fact, we've got 1,500 metres of potential and that's about the same as Mag Silver had. They, Mag Silver won a Scipio. They had a bigger license, but where the veins cut across, it was just across the corner of their license, and it was only a kilometre and a bit long, so we have potential for a reasonable discovery here. We've got a small company, uh, not many people are interested in the marketing uh, side of it here, but Simon and Mario are the founders of Fortuna Silver, and um, we've got enough money in the bank now to drill, so we're looking forward to drilling. So Radius has got a bunch of projects. Um, 
we just discussed Tropico. I wasn't going to discuss any of these today, but because the person after me has cancelled their speech, I think he was the politician, so they can cancel. Um, for anybody who's interested to stay, I will give you a quick talk about this Plata Verde deposit, or not a deposit, Plata Verde exploration project, and that's in joint venture with Fresneo. So we we'll just have to kindly pregunto el, el señor muy amable allá to cerrar on esto y abrir los, los fotos. I don't know, actually. I don't know the answer to that. What I... There are a lot of things I don't know about Fresneo District. One of the things that's complicated about Fresneo District is it's operated by Fresneo Mining Company, and they don't release any data. So the, you can go on their website and try and look it for stuff, and there's not much there, you know, for a big mining company. And, but all I do know is that the veins around that district, uh, so there's a lot of debate over whether there are real centers. Um, there's some reports by Torn Albinson that describes um, high-level silica in several places. Peter McGraw says that there's a centre there, but when I look at Juan Asipio, I haven't been there in person to have a look at it on the ground. But a lot of people get confused with centres between silicification and real surface deposition. Yep. Sorry? Yes. You should find fossils or reed class or wood or something in it, or you just got to know what it looks like. And I've seen hundreds of them, so I know what they look like because I live in a district where there's lots of them. There's a center on the farm behind my house. But I think that the, that I don't know why it's preserved in that area. Yeah? I don't know why it's not eroded, but they're there. And I did ask... Uh, Guillermo, the head of exploration of Fresneo, because Fresneo is our partner in this project that I'm about to show you. I said, are there real centers there? And he goes, oh, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Secret. Secreto. Uh, I said, but you can tell me, because we're partners on this project. And he said, well, I can tell you that, yes, we do have at least one center on the ground of Fresneo, but he can't tell me where. <laughs> Porque es Fresnillo, es secreto. Pero por suerte, este proyecto aquí es un joint venture between Fresnillo and um, Radius, so I can tell you all about it. Yeah? So, second slide, please. It's in the Sierra Madre. This is a different belt. Different belt of the country, Chihuahua, Sierra Madre, big mountains. This was a, a discovery that Javier led me to, which was very interesting because there's no historic records. The Mexican Geological Survey does a good job of identifying all the historic mines around the country and writing reports on them. And we have checked when we went there. When Javier invited me, he... I usually, before I spend the time to ride a horse two days into the mountains, I want to see maps, geochemistry, something interesting. And there was nothing. He didn't, we didn't, he didn't even have any samples. And we looked at the geological survey maps, nothing. Topographic maps, nothing. Um, historical files, nada. And when you look at it, you can't see anything there either. It's just... Now, most of the mines of the Sierra Madre were found historically, or they flew around in airplanes and saw the giant um, halos of alteration. Big red mountain, mulatos, sencillo. In uh, este caso que no. Segundo, por favor. So this is Javier pointing at the, at the mine. And what is the surprise is you can't see anything here. You, you know, if you looked at that, you think there's a big mine in there, like a really big one that has cavities as big as this room? Segundo, por favor. Tiene una capa. It has a cap of ignimbrite rocks over the top. They're actually volcanic agglomerates. The host unit is a basalt. And before we go on and explain it, I'd like you to think carefully and I'll explain this in, in Spanish so all the Mexican geologists can understand. Nosotros han trabajado en esto por dos o tres años uh, y ahora tiene Fresnillo como socios. 
y Fresh New es la, eh, la empresa más grande de plata en el mundo. Y nosotros tienen experiencia, yo llevaron los rocas a muchos geólogos en todos lugares y yo todavía no sabemos dónde, está, dónde es la fuente de los fluidos. Yo no sé si es epitermal, es sedimentario, es, es los fluidos traer de un intrusivo, si viene de, de dónde, yo no sé. So, este proyecto es un misterio completo que yo no entiendo. So, si alguien de ustedes tiene un idea sobre este proyecto, ¿dónde sale la plata? Por favor, hablar conmigo después. So that's the portal, the waste dump. You can see no alteration in the waste dumps. Segundo, por favor. Esto es el intro de la mina. La, la primera mina, nosotros entraron, no pueden mirar, está en el bosque. Entraron y asustar de hay una excavación enorme, más grande de esta sala. 30 metros de altura, 50, 100 metros de ancho y, y 100 metros de largo, completamente vacío. Todo, they mined it all, they took it all out and this was probably, we think, pre-1890, pre-1900s, we don't know when. Los Tarahumara Indians que viven allá, they don't remember who mined it. We met the old Tarahumara Indians, the oldest in the one or two houses there, a few villages, and we say, who mined this thing? Did, did your parents work here? Did your grandparents work here? And they would say, no, no tengo idea. We don't know who mined it or when. And you can see for scale, that, that's one of the local uh, Tarahumara guys. Um, and a uh, bit of health and safety, he should be wearing a helmet and boots and everything, and now we've bought them for him. Segundo, por favor. So, estos son algunas fotos de las minas, y cuando mira esto, uno mira lo... Sorry, I keep jumping Spanish to English. When you look at this, you would think that it's a cave. It doesn't look like a mine, but it's a mine. You can see the way they mined it with hammer and chisel and black, ex black powder explosives. Segundo, por favor. So, when I first went there with Javier, um, I didn't know how to assess it. So we just walked down the entrance and I stopped every 10 meters and I took a channel sample from as high as I could reach with my pick to the floor and those were the first 10 channel samples. Those are assays of silver. Um, so 600 grams, 60. In the entire system that we've, that we've sampled to date, which is extensive, the average grade is about 160 silver. So, proximo, por favor. So this gives you an idea of the extension of the mines. We did a lot of sampling at surface. We couldn't get much silver anywhere. All of these samples, nearly all of them, are underground samples of the mines. And the distance between, there's a big fault here. This is cut off. It's a, it's a cliff face that drops down about... 100 meters, you don't want to go off the edge of that cliff face. From here to the top is about 650 meters, and it's about 400 meters wide, and really the only exposure is underground. But this is our sampling, it just shows that there's some decent grades in there. Proximal, por favor. And it's just an anastomosing series of caverns. Um, it's hosted in basalt, and the basalt is not altered, huh? which is really weird. It has some alteration, but very, very Devon, very weak, weak alteration. There's no pyrite, there's no uh, argillic alteration, there's no kale, and there's no clay. There's none of the usual things that you would find in any kind of altered system. Proximal. Estos, that just shows you the size again. Next one. G 
just showing the size, next one. So the mineralization, what's the mineralization? It's an unusual mineralization. The reason we call the project Plata Verde is porque estos los óxidos de plata son verde. Um, so if you saw any alteration from a distance or you walked across a rock and you looked at it, you would see green moss. People didn't pick it up. It looks like, so these are infilling, low temperature fluids that are mostly calcite, silica, some barite, and banded silver chlorides. So these are the silver chlorides. The good thing is they leach like crazy. We get, uh, talk about metallurgy in a moment, but these banded silver chlorides fill up every gap within the basalt. Proxima. That's just fracturing within the basalt, filled with um, banded uh, silver chlorides, barite, calcite, silica. And you can see even here, not so clearly, but these are vesicles. So this was an airflow basalt. It flowed out over the ground in the air, and it has vesicles in it, and the vesicles are filled. So vesicles for the non-geologists are, are, are gas bubbles. When it bubbled out, it had gas in it, and the gas evaporated, it left a hole, and the, and the holes are filled with the, with the mineralization as well. Pro proximal. That's the, the nice silver um, chlorides in the barite calcite. Proximal. So we have, at first we didn't understand it. I've got a better idea now of how the, the, what the mineralization that we see, how that developed, but what I don't know is where the fluids came from. But this is just fracturing within the basalt. There is no structural control anywhere. There are no faults. There are no breaches. Um, it's just cooling fractures within the basalt that is filled. And this guy, um, mi amigo Joaquin, is on, he was a miner in Peral. He worked underground with his dad since he was a kid. And he was the one that explained to me how they mined it because he could see all the holes in that and the hammer marks on the walls that, you know, he said, this was mined, you know, hammer and chisel, black powder. Proximal. That's a, a breccia. Um, and at first, we thought that these breccias were breccia pipes. But what I've subsequently discovered that these are basal flow breccias. So when the basaltic volcano erupted, the, the the flow of basalt came out, flowed across the ground, and if anybody's been to a modern basaltic volcano, the, the base of the volcanic flow is, is rubble, it's brecciated, it's traveling along the ground, it gets all broken up, the top of it the same, and modern basaltic volcanoes are filled with lava caves, yeah? tubes, lava tubes, and you've seen the, those big crystal geodes from Brazil that have the amethyst in it, big holes with amethyst in it, those are from basalts. And this is a similar environment. This is a basalt that has been filled with silver chlorides. Proximal. Um, the only markings, if any exploration geologists are out here, when you go into a historic mine in Mexico, what you find on the walls is paint and nails and sample tags and spray paint and bits of wood with sample numbers written on them and um, things like that to show other people have been there. We never saw any sample tags, any paint, any nails, any tickets. Nobody had ever been inside. The only thing we could see were these numbers painted on the walls and they're Roman numerals, that's number five, but we found up to number 52 different mining chambers of significant scale 
And we think that they were using Roman numerals, the British used to use them. So we think that maybe it was the British, because we don't think that the Spanish used to use Roman numerals. We're not sure. But that's the only sign of anybody there before us. Proximal. This is disseminated um, silver mineralization. It's not with the, with the calcite, nor the silica, nor the barite. It's just disseminated, and it's kind of bleached the basalt. The basalt is bleached, and the black is silver chlorides. Proximal, por favor. Disseminated, proximal. That's Joaquin 51. 51 mining chambers. Um, it took me two or three days to walk through them all and find them all because they're just all anastomosing. And when we talk about mining chambers, we don't talk about small chambers. You can see the roof height above Joaquin. There's the roof height is sort of two, four, six, eight, ten meters to the roof height. So about this height in here, fully mined out. Proximal. We thought that these were silver bars. <laughs> we found them in a sack in the mine. We got very excited. And uh, we thought they were silver bars, but I subsequently put an XRF gun on it later, after my chief geologist had purchased one of them for its weight in silver. We put an XRF gun on, and we found out they were lead weights. But we found them in an old sack when we were doing the detailed sampling, and we were all excited for a while, but proximal. So this is just a map early on. Javier made it, you know, it says that we've got breccia pipes in the center which have better mineralization and uh, stock work and disseminated. And that was when we were thinking about a traditional model with volcanism and things like that. But, uh, you know, this has been superseded. So what it just shows you is the scale. The scale bar here is 50 meters. So this chamber here is like, 100 meters across, fully mined out. Proximal. Uh, it's one of the other mines. Proximal. Grades. We've got good grades. On average, in the, in the basal breaches, we're getting 350 grams, I think, 250 grams in general of all samples that we took, and we've now taken about five, 600. The average grade remains about 150 silver, proximal. We did some geophysics. We were thinking about where the fluids are coming from, and I had this idea that there would be feeders, and I put this together to convince people to give me money to drill it. Um, and But I don't think there's feeders because there's no evidence. You can't see anything vertically coming from below on the floors of the mines. You can't see structures. I don't think that there are, that these feeders are there. I now think this is a continental basin that had this flow in it, but, and we don't know where the fluids come from. But what we can tell is up the top, that's the real scale of those mines, and we can see that there's potential for them to go in, you know, maybe a kilometer to the west, and up the hill, we have no idea how far they could go. They could go a long way. Proximal. Cortar esto. It's a video of us sampling and some videos. I think that's it, the presentation. Yeah, it's, that's Plata Verde, and if anybody has any idea about, so Fresneo's our partner. They're going to start drilling in a couple of months. They recognize scale, of course. But I would talk to Guillermo, the, the head of exploration of Fresneo, who's been out here, and I said to him, where do you think the fluids are coming from? And he says, I've got no idea. And he's, been, he's done a PhD on that district. He's worked there for 30 years. He says, I've got no idea where the fluids are coming from. Gracias.